من الليل تبتك الروح إليك يا الله لأن أوامرك نور على الأرض This is Jerusalem, the holy city of our ancient forefathers. The great walls of the city held together nations, survived centuries of battles and conquests, rose and fell and rose again under the rule of many different leaders. Jerusalem represents the hopes and dreams of mankind. It is the home to hundreds of millions who have never even set foot on its soil. From Judaism to Christianity to Islam, Jerusalem is the rock of religion. For the Orthodox Christian world, it is the symbol of the strong church of our Holy Fathers. It is the center of our spiritual world. Jerusalem is the mother church of our faith, the physical foundation that draws all Christians together. For 2,000 years, the Orthodox faithful were God's church and the devoted guardians of its holy sites. They were the ones that kept this sacred land in the name of the faith. But what we find behind the beautiful facade of the Patriarchate is often a horrifying truth. The Holy Orthodox Church in Jerusalem is suffering. It has been suffering for hundreds of years. The Church of Jerusalem, the mother church of all Christendom, has been secretly pillaged of its people, its land, and its spirituality for over four centuries. If we do not do anything to save this church and its people, it will surely die, like an old relic buried under the sand of a sinful world. This film will show you shocking evidence, proving the horrifying state of the Church of God in Jerusalem. It will stir your emotions, it will tear at your hearts, and it will spread the truth the truth will bear witness to the mission to save God's people from a slow spiritual death. In 1950, over 40,000 Orthodox lived within the walls of the old city, but that number has withered to less than 3,000 in recent years. The truth is, Orthodoxy is vanishing from the land of its birth. Since Pentecost, the Holy Church was composed of people from many lands throughout the ancient world. As Christianity began to grow, certain cities became known as major centers of the faith. These major centers were known as patriarchates, and each city from Alexandria to Antioch to Constantinople had a leader. Each holy leader, each patriarch, was equally respected and revered by all the other heads of the other cities. Even with different nationalities and languages, they shared a common bond in the truth of Jesus Christ. Jerusalem became a patriarchate in the 5th century after St. Helen, the mother of Emperor Constantine, helped make it a popular site for Christian pilgrimage. From this glorious city, the faith grew and flourished, and for centuries, the Arab Christians kept the true faith under the leadership of many strong Arab patriarchs. The Arabs uh, in the Holy Land have been there since the earliest times of Christianity. And if uh, you read the Acts of the Apostles in the New Testament and read about the coming of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, there is a mention of all the people from different nations who uh, were present to receive the Holy Spirit and Arabs were mentioned there in uh, specific terms. The original faithful of the land built up this Christian city, but centuries of war and strife tore at the people, especially during the Crusades, when the European foreigners did their best to disrupt the order of the land and the church. After the holy site's destruction, the Crusaders built what is now the Church of the Resurrection, the home of Christ's tomb, the Holy Sepulchre. Uh, Arabs belong to this church, uh, Arabs uh, have the right to be here and there were many good Arabs who were monks and 
rose to the ranks of bishops and there were Arab uh, patriarchs, especially after the Crusades uh, and until 1534, uh, the church had Arabs as patriarchs as well as people of other nationalities. In 1534, a Greek bishop named Germanus rose to power as the patriarch of Jerusalem. Germanus was at heart a Greek nationalist and he began to implement rulings, oftentimes unspoken, subverting the Arabs from the Jerusalem leadership. According to Greek and Russian scholars, this patriarch started the injustice by denying any Arab priest the right to become a bishop. He allied himself with the secretive fraternity of the Greek monks called the Brotherhood of the Holy Sepulchre, which rose to power that same year. The Brotherhood dominated the Church of Jerusalem and denied Arabs membership, masking their hidden nationalist agenda behind black robes and long beards. Negligence by the Greek leadership continued for years, and those who fought back were usually punished. In the late 1800s, Bishop Raphael Hawawini, an Arab who held an office in Russia, began his outspoken criticism of the Patriarchate. Bishop Raphael exposed Germanus and his followers for starting this unkind and unchristian tradition. The proof was clear. Decades of Greek dominance had exterminated Arab hierarchy within the church. The Patriarchate, under the shadow of the Brotherhood, had nearly succeeded in the annihilation of educated Arab Orthodox priests. Hawawini was a strong spokesman against the Brotherhood, which had been in power for over 300 years. He believed that the Brotherhood stood in direct opposition to Orthodox Christian practice. He demonstrated that their domination conflicted with canon law and standard Orthodox ecclesiology. Patriarch Spiridon, leader of the Church of Antioch at this time, denounced Raphael for his zealous and truthful beliefs. Raphael's actions stirred emotions all over Constantinople, Syria, Russia, and finally the United States. In 1893, Bishop Raphael wrote and published a book under a pseudonym that detailed the secretive history and practices of the Brotherhood. This small work was eye-opening and shocking to many. It put the Brotherhood to shame with its candid truths. The book was considered lost until 1995, when a copy was found in Jerusalem. Scholars quickly translated the book, and its evidence has helped prove many of the task force's powerful charges. The task force was formed in September 22, 1994 in Los Angeles, California, by Orthodox Christians in this hemisphere who are keenly aware of the chronic problems plaguing the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. The task force uh, is established for the purpose of preserving and rejuvenating Orthodox Christianity in its birthplace. Uh, the task force will work with the Orthodox Christians in the field to help them affecting the desired change in the said patriarchate so as to preserve their faith and protect their national identity and heritage. Metropolitan Philip Saliba of the North American Antiochian Archdiocese recognized the need for change. In 1994, he founded the task force to save the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. He pushed for a universal struggle against the Greek leaders who were abandoning their flock and neglecting their responsibility. As I went to the Taibi uh, uh, ten years ago and uh, four years ago, uh, I have discovered that many of our faithful family members and relatives and the village that was one time uh, all Orthodox in 1905, that uh, the village now less than one-third of it are uh, Orthodox and the rest are uh, belong to other denominations, uh, Latins, uh, Roman Catholic, uh, Baptist, and Jehovah Witnesses. The question became evident why these people are leaving, and simply uh, because of the spiritual uh, negligence and the lack of pastoral care and concern. In early December 1997, the task force sent representatives to the Holy Land. This nine-man delegation was made up of clergy, laity, and scholars, whose aim was to ignite the fire within the Arab Orthodox, to give them the support to stand and defend their faith. The regions within the Patriarchate's jurisdiction cover strange and complicated political boundaries. Due to the wars and division of land by in international policies, the region is split into three parts, Jordan, 
Palestine, and Israel. Three nationalities have interest here, Greeks, Arabs, and Jews. With the current governments in power, some laws complicate the nature of what divides church and state. Unfortunately, this has made it very difficult for the Arabs in this area to establish any policy, especially one with the goal of uniting each Arab Orthodox community under consistent leadership. Because the Arabs have never been favored in the political arena and still have no real power, it is difficult to plan any coordination within these communities. The Arab church has never stopped working towards unity despite these constant problems. On this particular occasion, one of the task force's objectives was to show how essential unity and strength really are among the faithful in the strife for change in the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. The delegation worked with three organized arms of Arab Orthodox laity from the regions, the Orthodox Society in Amman, the Orthodox Congress in Israel, and the Orthodox Committee in the PNA, each had a different approach to solving the problem. The task force's two-week mission was to be a catalyst for the Arab Orthodox within the Patriarchate to stand up for their rights. During this mission, the task force held nearly 80 meetings, most of which were highly productive. The team arrived in Amman, Jordan, and was greeted with open arms by the Orthodox Society's leadership. This organization was initiated more than 125 years ago by the Jordanian Orthodox with the goal of increasing Arab Orthodox awareness of the problems plaguing the Patriarchate and the preservation of Orthodox witness and identity. The task force quickly allied itself with this important Orthodox Christian movement. The faithful in the Patriarchate of Jerusalem uh, have tried for 125 years to change uh, the uncanonical and unprecedented practices of the hierarchs in the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. Uh, the system in the Patriarchate of Jerusalem is based on exclusion, excluding the Arab faithful from the participation uh, or in the administrative as well as uh, the financial affairs of their own Patriarchate. Uh, the task force uh, feels that working with the Orthodox Christians is very important element in the strive for change. Our society was founded to improve the lot of the faithful here by bringing in some spiritual awareness, by bringing in some historical awareness to prevent the squandering of the awqaf, of the endowments of the church, which our great grandfathers have given in years past, in centuries past, to the church in their recognition of the church's role in the life of its people, of its followers. These three organizations helped to bring the task force into close contact with those communities in desperate need of spiritual and material help. Though the Patriarchate denies any negligence, the problem quickly becomes evident with a tour of their church-run schools. One of the worst examples of neglect was the once flourishing Orthodox school in Ajloun, a village in northern Jordan. The Patriarch runs this unfortunate school and degrades the church for calling it Orthodox. It is even more degrading to be a young child forced to attend a school in such unhealthy and poor conditions. They're 10 years old. Look at, look at their furniture here. They don't even have a decent desk to write on. There's no heat, there's no light. Look at the walls. Look how sad of a condition. How can they read and write? How can they see? This is what the Patriarchate of Jerusalem offers to its own children. In a town of 4,000 Orthodox, this school teaches 50 children, none of which are Orthodox Christian. The Orthodox community wouldn't send their own children to this institution. Instead, they send them to the flourishing and much more compassionate Catholic and Protestant schools, better equipped and staffed with well-educated and qualified teachers. Here in Fries, Jordan, the Orthodox faithful came into direct confrontation with the Patriarch of Jerusalem. This small town with over 8,000 believers asked for assistance in building its badly needed high school. 
since many of its children were going to the Latins. Father Elias Swice and his community challenged the authority of the patriarch, who was relentless in his lack of fatherly care. Father Swice continuously requested aid. The patriarch denied them funds for their school, as well as Father Swice's meager salary. The task force stepped in and helped initiate a strong resistance and ultimately an uprising of Fuhais in 1996. This response to the patriarch's lack of spiritual care for his flock was the first of many instances in which the Arab Orthodox community demanded the care they so desperately needed. The people of this town, along with the support of the task force, built this new facility. It is a true testament to the strength of the faith in which the worldly powers of money and greed did not defeat the power of compassion and love. The Patriarch also denied aid to the people of Al Salt, Jordan, for the reviving of their own school. The school was forced to close due to its poor conditions. Many of these children were, like most other villages, forced to turn to other institutions for education. If money is the problem, it could easily be solved. This church, like many others, owns property around the school, which could be rented to generate the income needed for the people to fix and run the school. Sadly, however, the patriarch chose to keep the property locked up and shut down. Here, where opportunities are few and education is the most important aspect of one's youth, the patriarch of Jerusalem continues to deny the children of Arabic descent any opportunity to better their lives. If the leadership in Jerusalem truly believes that these schools give the children of Salt a decent educational experience, then it may explain the thought process behind the Patriarch and his followers. But in the midst of all of this neglect, several communities have, slowly but surely, been able to make positive changes without the Patriarch's help. The community of Madaba, Jordan, struggled for many years until they were able to raise the one million plus dollars that was needed to build the school that could educate their 600 children. Again, the patriarch did not donate a single dinar. The school is equipped with modern facilities and has well-educated teachers. The community leaders were not willing to sacrifice the education of their children to save a few pennies. The delegation visited the people of Al-Hassan, Jordan, home to 6,000 Orthodox. Since 1962, the community has been working on rebuilding the Orthodox school, which was originally erected in the 19th century. They had only the funds to start an elementary school that could hold 200 students. Of these 200, only 40 are Orthodox. When their students reach graduation, they are then able to attend the Latin high schools. The Al Hassan Orthodox are proud of their accomplishments, but they still face the problems of losing their children to other religions because of the lack of education. Their ultimate hope is to build the necessary facilities for a high school for both Christians and Muslims. Like the Madaba neighbors, the school received no donation or assistance from the Patriarch of Jerusalem. In Ramla, the Orthodox Christian community purchased a piece of land in 1991 and with their own donations were able to build a multi-story school building with modern facilities for grades 4 through 12. It is well equipped with science, laboratories and computers, but they are still far from reaching their goal. I need many things. Uh, we need uh, for the games, for the drill, for example. Uh, Many things, and we have been promised that uh, somebody from the uh, Orthodox Greek, uh, from uh, United States, that they will bring. Yes, they, that they will bring us many books. We didn't have nothing from them. The community bought it, not the church. Not, not the church. Not, not the, the church. No, 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 no. You see, in his letter to the uh, what's his name, Bartholomew from Constantinople, he mentioned that he built a school in Ramli and he's running it and it's his. So you understand now it's not his, he didn't do anything. He pays very, very little, I think, um, something six, like... Six, six, six hundred, maybe. Six, 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 six
something like $1,500 a month. This is all he pays. As of December 1997, when this film was shot, he was six months behind in his payments. Many poor families throughout this region can't afford to send their children to better, more expensive schools. There is no future to our child. You understand what? My child, they, they finished the school, and there is no, nowhere, no thing. There is not another big school to go, my child. This is what the problem. And our, uh, maybe I can't uh, give him money to go to the school because I, um, I am work, I am working in a plantation, man. There is no work, no work, little work. Week I work, another week I don't work because there is no work. The scattered Orthodox clubs of the Middle East, which are also established by the lay people, try to offer opportunities to their youth. Many villages have prominent Boy Scout clubs, such as this group of young boys in Bait Jalla, Palestine. Here, the kids turn to the secular clubs for unity and support. This lack of education, teamed with no spiritual fatherly care by both the patriarch and his priests, have brought chaos to the youth movement. Instead of growing in the church, the young Christians end up questioning the faith of their heritage. Many turn to the other religions, and some even fall away completely to the secular world. They are left dry with little if no spiritual satisfaction. Across the entire Middle East, several young communities are now starting to find the answers to the problems within their church that many deny exist. One such young leader is Vivian Ilyas of Elbina, Israel. She is translated by Fuad Farah. We need a patriarch who knows about our problems and who is ready to extend mm -hmm. to us uh, some assistance and help and support. <coughs> Not only financially, but also morally and spiritually, because there is a big rift between us as Orthodox and our uh, religious leadership. Mm -hmm. They don't feel with us. They are cut off from the society, from our community, and it uh, seems to us that we are living like orphans. We don't have the Holy Father to care for us. One energetic movement originated in Nazareth, where many young adults find time to lead spiritual discussions and Bible readings taught by educated laymen. They congregate, hold open forums, and sing hymns of worship. <laughs> The relationship between us and the patriarch was very bad. It has started in a, in a very bad way. And I don't know the main reasons for this. We wanted to straight this relationship with him. So we said, why not to, to initiate and to go to visit him once and to see what will, what will be his reaction. We went there and we talked to him, but uh, we weren't very comfortable from the way he spoke to us. About a month ago, we had our uh, Congress, Orthodox Congress in Israel. And I went to him himself and I gave him a letter of invitation. He had a pretext that it is the feast of the patriarch's patron. So they didn't come, none of the priests came. It's a pity because he, te he told me nobody is going to come. And he sent us a letter. I will translate it to the English and send it to you, and you'll see what kind of letter he sends. He says, I feel agonized that you do something like that during the day when our patriarch has the feast of his patron. And I don't know when the feast of his patron is. When the feast of Saint Theodorus is, I don't know. Nobody knows. We've tried to initiate and to, uh, to make things become better between us and him, but uh, he doesn't seem uh, to be satisfied with anything we do, and he, he chooses to be all the time to be far away from us. He refuses to come to these youth people and to talk to them and to explain a lot of things uh, to them. 
And so we, we you know, after a while we started to get um, um, depressed and we started to, to give up. And we, we can't uh, continue this relationship with him. Look, I think that uh, we have a problem with our metropolitan Nazareth um, because um, uh, he wants he wants from us uh, to be ser like like a servant to him. See, I think that it's very hard to deal with these people. In 1996, the task force sponsored George and six other young people from this area to come to America and be counselors at the Antiochian Village Orthodox Camp in Pennsylvania. The task force gave these young people a chance to learn Orthodox living and teachings and bring this way of life back to the Holy Land's youth. When I was last year when I participated, when I was uh, at the, the Antiochian Village in America, and I saw something different. Um, I think that the relationship between the youth there, the Orthodox youth there, better than here in Nazareth and the Holy Land, Holy Land generally. And I think that something that I learned there at the Antiochian Convent, they have a good relationship and they, they go to church, they pray like us, exactly, exactly like us. and. Um, um, they believe in God, Jesus Christ, like us. The problem with the youth stems from lack of education and a strong resentment by the Patriarchate for the strength of Orthodox Arabs. The Brotherhood of the Holy Sepulchre has clearly endorsed this prejudice. Their negative attitude to their Arab flock has left many young men bitter against the Church. Fortunately, several young men still feel called to God's service even in the face of rejection by their Greek leaders. One such man was Walid Fakuri, a young man in Mafraq, Jordan. Walid is a student who wants to go to the seminary, even though he has no support from his patriarch or bishop. I know Jesus. I want to do something to Jesus. Love Jesus. I, I want uh, to do something to Orthodox. To Orthodox. Yeah, here. Here or uh, anywhere, anywhere in, in the world. In the world. Even if Walid was able to go to the Bellaman Seminary in Lebanon, the problem of ordination still awaits him. Patriarch Diodorus has made it clear that he will not ordain any unmarried seminarian a priest. This is not because he feels celibacy is harmful, but rather that he is following the tradition of his predecessors. By denying ordination of celibate seminarians, there is no chance for an Arab to become a bishop. This leaves many of the seminarians stuck with no job, nor any real Christian duty, not to mention communities without priests. The denial of ordain, ordaining young men uh, who are studying at the Belamand, and we are thankful to his, to his beatitude, Pater Ignatius of Antioch, and uh, the Church of Antioch for nurturing uh, the, 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 the young men um, uh, to become servant of God. And these young men, like we have now, Five of them are, are just roaming around in, 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 in Amman doing nothing simply because the Patriarch is not willing to uh, ordain young educated people and place them in Madaba or in Mafraq or in Rami. And you have witnessed in this trip a priest in the age of 80s and above who serving four or five thousand uh, souls. It's really very sad circumstances. Here outside the walls of Jerusalem and Bethany is a special home for the sick, elderly, and handicapped. The Four Homes of Mercy is a home for both Christians and Muslims of all ages. Large numbers of young children are cared for here, many of which are mentally and physically ill. This is an Orthodox-run home, but it is not connected with the Patriarchate. Because of this, he has never given to this home, nor has he ever visited his poor flock. The Murberries is a small Orthodox-run clinic operating on the land connected to the Patriarchate in Jerusalem. The Patriarch lets the clinic run without charging rent, but does not give anything more. This clinic serves all the people of Jerusalem and turns down no one.
especially those who cannot pay. The clinic serves everybody, regardless of religion, regardless of faith, sex, creed, color, etc. It's the leadership which is orthodox. We want to maintain it like this. And this is our weakness at the moment when Christians are eroding. And I underline this word. In Jerusalem only, there are only 1.2% of the population as Christians. And the orthodox community, which used to be the majority, is regularly, systematically eroding because they need a lot of support and the support is not available. Some of the worst acts, even in the face of denial, are the sales of church land to the Israeli government. Much of this precious land had been donated to the church by the faithful throughout the centuries. Due to the greed of this brotherhood, more and more of the Orthodox Church's holy grounds are being turned into Israeli settlements and facilities. On the road to Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus Christ, we find the monastery of St. Elias, which the Israeli authorities recently confiscated. When the patriarch offered no resistance to the takeover, many suspected he struck a deal with the government officials. Newspapers and the media soon published accounts of this transaction, even when the patriarch kept silent. Information regarding his many transactions has been stipulated to be kept secret until after his death. The sale of the 700,000 square meters has been estimated to bring to the Patriarch over $15 million. Not one penny of this monumental amount of funds was used to benefit the church. In 1975, Israelis built an automobile factory on what is known as Qasr al-Mitran, a large piece of land that was registered to the Holy Orthodox Church since the end of the British Mandate in 1947. This was one of the best areas in Nazareth, not to mention the entire Patriarchate. Due to the undisclosed nature of the sale, no one has been able to determine how much the Patriarch received for this land. Over 400,000 square meters of Orthodox property is now in the hands of the Israelis, who built a military factory on it. The people of Nazareth had hoped to build a church school and a parish cemetery here. Unfortunately, a bus depot was built there instead. These lands are the property of the community, not of the person. But the Patriarch is using now this dilemma in Jerusalem where he can go from one side to another side to a third side. Suppose that he finds uh, some pressure from Jordan, he will say that I follow Arafat. If he finds some pressure from Arafat, he says no, the situation, the defect situation in Jerusalem, it is a part of Israel. So he tries to, to flirt with the, with the Jews. So until we come to a stabilization of the situation, he will have freedom to be away from any case in the law, in, in the courts. These shots taken while driving through the streets of Jaffa and Tel Aviv, Israel, show what is known as the Souk al Der, or the marketplace of the Orthodox Church. These many streets and shopping centers were entirely owned by the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. Each shop brought in an income of at least $1,000 per month. Just by looking at them, one can begin to see how great a sum this added up to. Just these past few months, the Patriarch sold this entire shopping district to the Israeli government for a sum of six million dollars. Perhaps the most disturbing sale of land took place in Jaffa. Overlooking the Mediterranean Sea sits St. George Orthodox Church. Here the community struggles to raise funds for their small nursery and to keep up their frail structure. St. George sits on prime land where much of its adjoining property was recently sold to Israeli contractors for the hopes of building hotel resorts. This was the cemetery. He saw the cemetery and look this, at the building. This and is the this is the famous Orthodox school is rented for the Israelis. You mean that's this property cemetery and uh, football uh, stadium. Football, uh, they're finishing up one building, but they're putting up another building right here, a condo project. It's going to be about 20 story high. This is amazing. 
هاي اللمينة هاي انبعت كمان من الملك و this one too here look at this building here this was all sold it was all Asadak's properties and now they're building all condominiums all around the church that's church property that's church property of course all this and over there was the Orthodox College here is to improve this is was a cemetery you see to prove this was a cemetery it was a cemetery it was a cemetery the Hawla Wala how you see it this was a cemetery This is a grave of a priest who died in 1891. This place, it's a cemetery, and the other place where the patriarchate built now all the apartments, it was a very big cemetery. And then our community took all the bones in this place, the cemetery, and put it in the grave you, see, you have seen it outside on the, on the right side our patriarchate took this uh, land it's about 16 dunam of land you see and then he, he make a contract with a company from S switzerland this place uh, uh, he give to the, this uh, company for 100 1 million and a half he took this uh, land and then he he, he sell it to uh, an, another uh, company, a Canadian company, for 11 million dollars. It's like what happened. And in what makes us nervous that all these buildings, no one of our community are allowed to enter or uh, to to buy. Uh, None of the money made was given to the community to help support the church or the people. Recently, more land outside Nazareth, Bethlehem, and Chada were also sold. St. John the Baptist, the closest church to the Holy Sepulchre, was just sold to Israel in 1997. If we really want to succeed, we have to make our cause a national cause, and not a cause of, of a community, that's, that's to say an orthodox cause, because the patriarch is selling lands to our enemy, and we know that by doing this, he is betraying his job as a guardian to the properties of the church. We must remember that these lands were the lands walked by Christ and his followers. These are churches built by his apostles. It is not simply property, but history that is being lost. The property of the church belongs to the church itself, which is made up uh, uh, from the faithful. The function of the hierarchs in any church is to act as custodian and protectors of the church property. The hierarchs in the Church of Jerusalem have added insult on injury to the church by plundering the church property without any form of accountability uh, uh, or uh, f for any good reason. Uh, I like here to cite the uh, canon of the apostles number 12 of the canons of the church, which states, if any bishop or any abbot be found disposing of productive property of the bishopric or monastery, the transfer is to be invalid or void, and let the property be restored to the bishopric or to the monastery as the case may be and let the bishop or the abbot who does this be driven out, the bishop out of the of bishopric and the abbot out of the monastery on the ground that they are plundering wrongfully what they did not gather. This is a straightforward answer to the wrongdoing of the hierarchs in the Patriarchate of Jerusalem. High above Nazareth is the community of St. Barbara in El Binna, North Israel. This small community of 1,000 struggles to keep their church functioning, even without a priest. Their last priest, who helped build this community, died over two years ago and has not been replaced. Church leaders say they have been ignored for the past 10 years. This lack of pastoral care has harmed the community, although they still remain faithful, attempting to continue to build a parish hall, which is virtually non-existent. Here in this church, there is no toilet and no water, you know? And uh, all the building here is 
from the people of this village, from the money of these people. Nobody, nobody helps you. Anyway? Nobody help. We need a, a breeze, yeah, and we need many things here. We need a, a club for the young people, for the women, and uh, we need toilet, water, many things. To those who have faith, physical problems do not matter. Even in this church, which hardly has room for 40 of the 1,000 believers, the power of orthodoxy lives, with or without the blessing or aid of the patriarch. The people of Kufr Smei, a town in northern Israel, have recently won a long, painful court battle against the patriarch. This community of Saints Constantine and Helen, 300 orthodox strong, had hoped to leave their extremely small and insufficient home and build a new church. They did so without any aid from Jerusalem. But when they began construction and would not register the church in the name of the patriarch, he sued them for all they had. The 45 families were left with no choice but to fight back. This court battle lasted over six years, ending with their winning their claims of ownership. According to the decision in the uh, Israeli, court. Israeli court, the center Israeli court, the patriarch and his um, uh, uh, Lawyer? Uh, missioners, uh -huh. missioners, and the uh, one who is uh, yes. his wakilo, uh, yeah, a representative. his representative from this uh, community, must not. They are not allowed to walk. Uh, uh, around this and inside this uh, church. If the property uh, is registered in the name of the Orthodox community of that village, the local Orthodox community, it is theirs and it's not the Patriots. And this is a very good precedent which we will use in our villages because in many villages the land is still registered in the name of the local community. Their success, however, has been short-lived. They spent all they had on this battle, totaling over $50,000. Financial needs. No financial needs. We are uh, very, very short of financial needs. They, they financial yeah, we financial. have zero now. These people are happy to be free, and they will continue to fight for their rights in the face of greed and pastoral neglect. The people of the Jabal Al-Taj Church in Amman started building a home in 1962, and over 35 years later, it is still incomplete. Of the $180,000 spent during these past three decades, the patriarch donated only $12,000. The church has beautiful icons, but little else. In its rundown fellowship hall, a local member shows how they have little to offer to their people. People, young people here, and, you know, both girls and boys, they are collecting in Sunday's meetings for the, discussing the Bible and, you know, the, the ch ch Christians' uh, matters, you know, as a matter of the, you know, but this is not for the party. We cannot make a party here, only for collecting and uh, gathering. And sometime in uh, Easter day, during the fasting time, they make uh, some foods, gathering from the people and separating here celebrating their each other. The Church of the Ascension overlooks Jerusalem on the top of the legendary Mount of Olives. This once beautiful church was a very prominent home for many Orthodox of the city. But because of its location, a group of radical Israelis bulldozed the church to the ground, wanting to build a hotel in its place. The same group was thought responsible for beating up its priest and killing the poor man's elderly mother, though no solid evidence was found. Father John, the priest, was Greek and appealed to the Greek government for aid. The problem became tangled in bad politics, hardening the situation. The church was destroyed, but Father John's spirit was not crushed. He used all his savings to build a small chapel where he is able to hold services. He painted each and every icon which adorns the chapel. But the problems still exist. 
Ignored and helpless, this small church is littered with garbage. The exterior looks more like a trash heap than a place of worship. Two small churches adjoin the sanctuary of St. James. This church is dedicated to the 40 martyrs of Sebast, and it houses the relics of many past patriarchs. But it is physically neglected and continues to fall apart, especially here in its holy altar. In fact, uh, the saddest part of it is looking at the churches and their total negligence, some of them almost collapsing. But even to the church of St. Joseph of Arimathea next to St. Jacob Church and the compound of the Holy Sepulchre, uh, we saw the beautiful church um, from outside. It looks good, but as we look to this open the door to see to the altar, to venerate the, the altar, uh, there was no altar, and to our shocking, it was a play, it was a storage room, and it was a, a trash practically there. That uh, in itself tells us that the man and his uh, uh, entourage, or the men and the people that around him, these bishops, uh, don't care really for the church. They care for their pocketbook. Ultimately, the real problem at hand is not land nor money, but the very lack of spiritual leadership and Christian care. Unfortunately, there is a great deficiency in spiritual awareness amongst the faithful, and the uh, upper uh, clergy does not do a thing to remove that deficiency. The spiritual concern is the right concern for us here in the area as an Orthodox believers. And uh, to add on the spiritual concern, God is, God is concerning for the whole human being, for soul and for spirit and for body. We don't have any spiritual uh, experience with the Word of God, with, with, the, with the church, with Christ uh, himself. So what we really need is, what you look for is to support those Christians towards Orthodox teaching and theology and not just to church history and tradition because church history and tradition doesn't fulfill the need of the spirit and the need of the soul of the, especially the youth here in the country. All of this lack of spirituality stems from the lack of harmony and love between the laity and the clergy, who have for the most part sided with the patriarch. Why? Because the patriarch has been able to buy out these priests' loyalty to God and replace it with money and greed. Some of the worst instances of spiritual negligence happen in the very center of the Mother Church. In the Holy Sepulchre itself, witness what happens when a group of tourists accidentally enters the church that is under reconstruction. No, they open. It's closed, but they open. No, no. I, I, kept, I passed from there, and the door was open. And the way you screamed, you made us think that there was something wrong with disaster. They do wrong. Okay, so take us care of the door. You know your own business. You look at yourself here, and that's all. Okay. As you can see, he kicked the people out because he went there, these people went in, they want to pray, and this Greek uh, Achaman right kicked these people out. Did you see it? No, watch. Like how he went to lock the door and coming back. Yeah, no, no. One of these days, you, one of these days, this Arabic Orthodox Church will be liberated from the yoke of the Greeks. We will be with my friend. Christ build it, the disciples build it, Christ build it, Christ build the church.
This is the negative attitude that Christians from all of the world are forced to witness. This lack of love and humility shames the guardians of the Mother Church. In every church that we have met, in every situation that we have discussed with the people here, his interaction with them, they have universally been negative. Not only negative, but destructive. He has done nothing that I can see in all of the meetings that we've gone to that has contributed to the well-being of the church, either spiritually or materially. And to the contrary, in a, quite a number of the areas, he has actually taken a, extra effort to be destructive, both to the spiritual and physical life of, of his people here. So he's much more than a, a negligent patriarch. He is a destroyer of the church, and he is uh, in opposition to the faithful, and to the building up of the Church of God in, in, in this area of the world. An unfortunate confrontation occurred in al Qadak, Jordan, when the task force and Dr. Abu Jabr met with the priests and the church leaders to start a new chapter of the Orthodox society. The people of Qadak simply wanted their patriarch to show some compassion to their community. Well, I remember in one situation, a priest got so angry at the task force that uh, he almost picked up a uh, glass, uh, a drinking glass in his hands and was ready to throw it at us. That's what it seemed to be. To, to be. And in fact, uh, I motioned to one of our uh, fellow priests in the room at, to look for the nearest exit <laughs> because we were ready to get out of there at all possible because it looked like a riot was about to break out. <laughs> This outrageous display of anger, unbecoming of a priest, does not reflect the humility one must show towards the children of God. There is a definite polarity between clergy and laity, which is really a shame. The clergy are responsible to shepherd the sheep. The hierarchy is responsible to shepherd the sheep. And all these dear people want, from what they have told us, is to be cared for, to be loved, to have their physical and spiritual needs uh, attended to, and, and that's what the scriptures teach, that's what the church teaches, that, that the shepherd would take care of the sheep. During their visit to Nazareth, the task force attended the divine liturgy at the Church of the Annunciation. Afterwards, they met with a large group of church leaders. While the meeting was underway, it became evident that one of their priests, Father Romanos, was not in accord with his community. He was siding and defending the patriarch, who was, as usual, being accused of neglect. Father Romanos began apologizing for the patriarch's absence because he could not defend these charges. This started a heated argument. His own father stormed out of the meeting, and his mother criticized him before the community. <laughs> The other priests had remained silent, but the meeting reflected a split between the people and one of their spiritual fathers. We want our patriarch and bishops from our kind and not foreigners. So as we pray, he won't put up his hand and tell us to stop praying in Arabic and demand we pray in Greek. We are all Middle Eastern, and they don't understand Arabic. They pray in Greek, and we get lost in the service. The world got liberated, so why is he controlling us? Why is he oppressing us? Since 1967, the patriarch has chopped one of the legs, and he's uh, running the patriarch with only the clergy, and definitely the clergy are the, the leadership of the clergy are Greeks, and uh, therefore he totally excluded any representation of the local. This is the essence of the problem. We are not asking for a revolution here. We don't want to kick him out, but rather we want to share. The unfortunate thing about the whole matter is that the Greek element in our patriarchate thinks and believes strongly that the patriarchate of Jerusalem 
is a legacy, an eternal legacy for the Greek race. And we say and wonder, what has Christianity to offer if this is the case? Jesus Christ, our Savior, was for all people, irrespective of race or language. He came to save humanity. Where is the Christian love that we all aspire to when a church, a whole patriarchate, one of the four apostolic patriarchs, is being limited to the Greek race? When the truth is that the people of the land anywhere in the world, the followers of the church, are really the people of the church in that land. There are some strong priests within the church who do dare to speak and lead their communities into direct struggle with the patriarch. One example is the village of Kufr Yasif, led by a young and determined priest, Father Atala Makuli, the people are working side by side with clergy to bring about change. They too are presently building a new home, but with no help from Jerusalem. We are fighting to get our rights from our patriarch, to look after us more, to the churches and to the laity. We need to preserve the church and spread the word of the church. We are missing this. We need to spread it to our children. We inherited from Jesus Christ a mission to go and spread the word of God, to go to all nations and to teach in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I want to stress that we must pay attention to teaching, and teaching must be on both sides, for priests and for leaders, for the young children and for the Sunday schools, because we need that very much. We do not believe most of our Orthodox are Orthodox in inheritance and not in belief. We want to change this situation and to be Orthodox in faith and in life. And this must be by your support to us in the missions and in preparing lead, in, leaders to uh, teach our children so as to be the true Orthodox that can live their Orthodoxy daily and be a successful uh, church. This is Rama in Upper Galilee, named after St. Joseph of Arimathea. Here at the Church of St. George, the people are in need of a young priest to help their 4,000 parishioners. Their current priest, Father Nicola, is 80 years old and can hardly serve such a large community. In Jerusalem, many of the Arab clergy are old, and those who challenge the patriarch have been discharged from their posts. The delegation met an old bishop who was no longer in charge of his region. They also met Bishop Nikiforos, a Greek bishop who was so outspoken against the patriarch's conduct and mismanagement that he was defrocked. Each and every community visited expressed concern for the lack of attention and love given to them by their Holy Father, Patriarch Diodoros. Their pains at each of these physical losses would be lessened if only this man would send true messengers of God's Holy Word to administer to them. But instead, they are abandoned like poor orphans fighting for their own. Another thing that just absolutely was uh, uh, shocking to me was to see the many, many hundreds, I understand thousands of store shops that exist here that uh, he is receiving income from uh, with absolute no accountability given for how the funds are used and uh, the, the uh, uh, lack of rechanneling of those funds for the purpose of helping the indigenous church here. Back in Madaba, St. George's Church is known for an ancient mosaic map that lines the floor of this old sanctuary. This map of the Holy Land was placed there in the 5th century when the original temple was built. But when it was later rebuilt, most of the map was destroyed. Today it is roped off for protection. 
It has become a well-known tourist attraction. Like many other holy sites and tourist attractions in the Patriarchate, it brings in a great deal of income each year. One of the most popular sites in the Holy Land is Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus Christ. Here in this bustling city is the magnificent Church of the Nativity. Built in the fourth century by Emperor Constantine the Great, this church was at one time a beautiful, well-kept home to tens of thousands of Orthodox. While 20,000 Orthodox still live in and around Bethlehem, the church is in poor shape. This is surprising, given the amount of tourism that pours in daily to see the birthplace of Christ. This priest's job is to oversee the souvenir sales to tourists and visitors. This small table is said to bring in over $1 million each year. With all this tourism, especially during the holy seasons, money pours into this church. It is said that once the $1 million goal has been met, the priest is allowed to keep whatever else he makes from this table. The church itself sees none of these tourist donations. If it did, then why is this church in such poor condition? Those tourists who come from all over the world must shudder when they see how deteriorated the birthplace of Christ has become. At the site of Christ's crucifixion, a breathtaking shrine was erected long before the Brotherhood of the Holy Sepulchre rose to power. Of course, the sepulchre is the holiest temple in all of Christendom, and it brings in the most revenue each year. The question finally must be answered, where does this money go? This money, from the sale of church property to the millions of dollars in revenue and rent, must go somewhere. But there is no accountability. There is no answer, no official answer. It doesn't go to the schools, or to the churches, or the local people who need it. But we do know that money was spent suing communities like Kufr Smey. The Patriarch is known for giving bribes to his supporters for their loyalty. For example, each priest in the Patriarchate, whose meager salary is $300 a month, received a sum of $7,000 as a bonus gift last Christmas. Father Elias Swice, who led the uprising in Fuhaste, did not receive anything. Money was spent on this grand palace in Amman. It was built next door to the beautiful edifice of St. Sophia, the Orthodox Cathedral. This chancery is home to one Greek metropolitan and a few servants. Compare it to the only Arab bishop's chancery, which is just a few minutes away by car. This palace is a small example of what some of this money has done. This cathedral is one of the better kept churches of this area. There is a huge bronze door that shows many saints sitting besides Christ. If one looks closely, you will be able to recognize Patriarch Diodorus, glasses and all, sitting at Jesus' right hand. This door was reported to have cost $50,000. I think it uh, was very significant because in this trip we, we got to speak to so many people. We went to so many churches and, and met with so many of the indigenous Christians here throughout the land from one end to the other. And I can say now that I know because I have met so many people uh, of the very real concerns that the task force has expressed for these last few years. They are very real concerns. And uh, if I was not absolutely convinced before of uh, the plight of the church here, I am now. And it's like St. Paul said in the book of Corinthians, he said, if one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. And because we are one body in Christ. And just because we came over here from America does not mean we're not one body. We're one body with these dear people. We're all one body in Christ. We're one people of God. And therefore, we do bear some responsibility to, to do whatever we can to help in this situation. Every incident that we experienced was uh, really a, a shocker to me. 
I went from shock to shock. I'm still in a state of shock. And so we are fighting not because of our own glory or because we want our name to be written in the books at all. We are fighting what God gave us to protect and that to protect the mother church and so it will be living stones, not dead stones there, living stones, people who are living in churches once again, uh, uh, caring for each other, glorifying God. The people of the Mother Church are suffering and they need the support of all their Christian brothers and sisters everywhere. No time has ever been as important. No time has ever been as oppressive. No time has ever needed swifter justice. With less than 3,000 Orthodox left in this holy city, how long will it be before Orthodox Christianity becomes a thing of the past? How long will it be before the faith becomes buried in the sand, hidden behind the locked doors of the secretive brotherhood? He will weep, he will cry, he will do, he will act as a good actor against the nationalists, the Jordanian nationalists, the Palestinian nationalists, who will stand against him. So don't be misled by his cry, his crying. He's an actor. And they are all actors, and they know how to play their roles. According to our Orthodox Church teachings, the Church was one, is one, and always shall be one. The Orthodox faith is the faith which was delivered to the saints once and for all by our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, the Church of Jerusalem should concern every Orthodox Christian worldwide the combined effort from all Orthodox Christians in the field as well as outside the Patriarchate of Jerusalem should be directed to effect a change in the Patriarchate of Jerusalem to put it back on the line of its apostolic mission. It might be the most important orthodox task in modern history. We have a duty. We have been called to rescue the body and soul of our Lord Jesus Christ, and that body is the Holy Orthodox Church. As one part of the body suffers, so each and every part of the body suffers. We must begin the healing process. We must heal the spirit of the Mother Church before it is too late. This is a, uh, a disaster that calls for a uh, drastic measures, you see. If we were to wait even another generation or two, there may be hardly anyone left. So this is the time in, in which to act. I, I do not believe that we have any other alternative.